All right. Welcome to week four. We are going to start talking about physical design this week. Um, hopefully we don't have any issues. Um, what I will be doing this week and next week uh, is finishing off the lecture material for the midterm. Uh, the week after that, I'll be doing a very quick review and then, you know, that badly planned demo I did at the end of the class yet last week, I'll be doing a much more version for everybody's enjoyment um, after the review. It'll cover everything right from start right to physical diagram step by step. So you have a complete complete view of everything you've learned so far. So, so today we're going to focus on the physical aspect and the design process in regards to the physical aspects. So the first one we're going to talk about is resolving relationships. Sorry, I'm a little rattled. I left home just in time to get here. One of my coworkers decided to corrupt our subversion repository. I guess we had to fix it. Anyways, uh, when we're resolving re uh, re relationships, we there's a couple of things we need to do. So if it's a one-to-one, -one, we don't need to do any kind of resolving because it's self-maintaining. A one-to-many, um, some people will consider one-to-many to be optional to resolve to a one-to-one -one in rare cases, and it's not something that is common. And usually you don't want to resolve a one to a one to one because you're probably going to lose something. And you have the many to many. Many to many is, although it says up there almost always desirable, realistically, uh, I think there might be one or two database products out there that actually support true many to many. And they're not things you could use on a regular basis. Like they're very specialty purpose databases. So it, the, the phrase should really read, resolving is always required, not, you know, almost always desirable. So a many-to-many, -many, which we've um, kind of discussed before, is when you have multiple things associated to multiple other things. And it would look something like that diagram here. So what would happen is if we had a true many-to-many, -many, we'd have duplicate data in both tables. So let's say an order has four products. You'd have to have the order in there four times mapping out to four different products, even though it's the same order four times. It's really bad. Um, so you wouldn't be able to ask questions, how many orders have been made and how many products did we sell because things are getting duplicated as it goes. So what we end up having to do is create an associative entity. And actual fact, this is kind of cool because I just taught this yesterday in my other class and they had they covered this in two different ways. And I'll actually cover both methods with you guys. So you create something called an associative entity. Essentially, it's a table that sits in the middle of the two. And it looks like this. Now, that associative entity can have one of two names. It is either known as an intersection or an association. An intersection only ever has the primary keys from the other two tables. An association will have the primary keys of the other two tables plus some extra data. So in here with this design, and yeah, okay, good. I just want to make sure I didn't forget something after this. So in this design, we know what subject a student took, a problem. It makes, you know, it's really clear, right? You got the student ID in here, you got the subject ID in here. We made the two foreign keys be part of the primary key. Therefore, it's a compound key. And that means that each student can only take a subject once. Now, can we tell when the student took the subject? What grade they got in that subject? We can't tell anything. So this is what's known as a pure intersection table. An association table, an associative table, 
would be the primary key being combined plus some other fields. So for example, one would be an enrollment date. Uh, you could have a grade. You could have um, maybe who taught the course. You could have a bunch of different fields in there. And the second you do that, it starts getting a little more complicated. Um, I'll actually write it on the board so you can see what I'm talking about. So if we have the student and we have the subject, and we have the uh, subject ID and whatever, the name of the subject, and in the student, same setup here, we've got the student ID and the student's name. Great, so we create the intersection table, should not be called student, probably should be called student subject and we have the student id and the subject id So this is essentially the same thing that was up there, except I also included the minimum cardinalities in my diagram, because realistically you should. And now we need to know when the student took the course. So we could throw on on here, uh, call it uh, enrolled, uh, grade, and, you know, could have some more stuff. Now, right now, we only have two keys, right? And then we have the enrolled. So what we have to do is actually include enrolled in the student subject so that we can keep track of when the student took that subject. So that means they can't enroll in the same subject twice at the same time. But if they didn't succeed the first time through and they have to do it again, they get to take it a second time. And that gives us the ability to do that by adding you know, the extra field. Now, you may also realize one other thing. This primary key is getting really fat. There's three pieces to this primary key. And if we suddenly have to add something else, it's going to get complicated. So realistically, um, what you'd need is give it a synthetic key and then include these three in a unique um, index, which I'll be talking about unique indexes later in the term. So what that would do is we could still search for a specific student subject by pulling it by specific ID. So, you know, student five, subject six, we can pull it up, you know, knowing that the ID is something else. But at the same time, the unique index will make sure that they can never enroll in the same thing twice at the same time. So you can't put the you can't put the student into, for example, you couldn't take eighty two fifty twice at the same time. Imagine if you're enrolled into two separate lectures of eighty two fifty and you had to come to school twice a week. Fine, there might be people that would benefit from that, but realistically, that's not how it works. So intersection tables are cool; they serve a good purpose. Uh, honestly, with how things have become in the modern age. Um, plain intersection tables are no longer sufficient. Now, I'm going to name out uh, a piece of American legislation called Sorbanes Oxley. Does that ring a bell for anybody in this room? All right. How about a company called Enron? Yeah, okay. One person heard of Enron. Uh, Nortel. Okay, I hope somebody else in here, other than two people, have heard of Nortel. Nortel used to be Ottawa's crowning glory crowning jewel of technology uh, until it was found out that the accountants were cooking the books 
they owed five times, basically owed five times what they actually had in capital. Um, the company was dissolved and broken up into smaller pieces. Enron was significantly larger sums of money and actually caused a minor economic depression in the US when it went under. So intersection tables like this don't enable you to do some very specific things. Specific things such as tracking who did what and when. So we end up having to add extra fields in this to know every single time somebody touches the data. And you suddenly need significantly more keys. You need to have some stuff that people can't touch. So from a pure concept, yes, this is how you resolve a many to many. In actual practical use, uh, people haven't done this since the late 80s, early 90s. Eh, late 90s, actually, because people hadn't learned their lessons yet about how corporations like playing with the numbers in their accounting books and having a second set of books to hide the fact that they're not actually making money. So nowadays, tables have a lot of extra auditing stuff on it, such as, you know, who touched it last, when was it last modified, that kind of stuff. And it's all fields that nobody can actually access through the interface. It's all, you can view the data, but you can't change the data. The only people that can change that data is the people that actually have access, physical access to the database, which in most big corporations is very few people get to go in and start typing in SQL queries to change the database. So long story short though, having a many to many, you need a, a table in the middle to bridge it because you cannot do many to many across in any modern database system. So now we're going to talk about the database design process. So the design process is iterative. It means you go over it repeatedly. Just like when you're developing an application, you add a feature, you make sure it works, you add another feature, you make sure it works and it didn't break the first feature. Then you'd release it. And then people complain, so you add more features on and on and on and on. You're constantly making changes. Um, there's also no perfect design. No matter what you're doing, what kind of database you're designing, there is no final perfect solution. Whenever you try to reach perfection, it usually causes more problems because theoretically you could just keep designing and adding and adding and adding just because you're thinking, well, maybe we should control this. Oh, maybe we need to keep that piece of data. And uh, here's a quick example. I'm going to do a um, transit tracking tool. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? You've got a bus route, you've got bus stops, and you've got a bus. But often people try to are always looking up specific addresses. So we're going to add some commonly looked up addresses in our system. Not those addresses. We also got to need to keep track of what businesses are there because maybe they'll search by business. Oh, now we've got the businesses. Okay. Uh, now we need addresses. We need all kinds of extra stuff. Maybe we should have some phone numbers. You know, if you just keep thinking of how much you can keep adding to the database, eventually you'll try to design the entire world in your database because you can just keep going. When you just think about the data that can be included in any given design, you can just keep going and going and going. And it's, you just stop. At, at, at a certain point in time, you need someone to actually look at your stuff and go, what are you doing? But literally, yeah. So somebody break out a sandal, throw it across the room. Um, so don't go for perfection. The goal is, can anybody know what the phrase is that they should be aiming for? Yeah. Good enough. Okay. Yeah. And so you go for the minimum that you need while not locking yourself into a design permanently because there's ways of designing a database without, you know, pigeonholing yourself to the point where it's good enough. Do we have everything a person could reasonably need from this without trying to make that 1% of users happy? You, honestly, if you get to the point where you can make 80% of your users happy, good enough. Don't ever go for the 1%. It's pointless. 
Heck, don't even go for like 90%. And that's also usually pointless. Um, like, you know, in Excel, 90% of features are used by less than 5% of Excel users. Word is the same way. I mean, how many of you in here know that you can create a footer whose lay the text in the footer changes depending on the first heading on the page? <laughs> yes, I know how to do it because I used to train people how to use Word years and years and years ago. But is that a feature most of you need to even know? No, because you're a part of the eight, the 90, 95% of the rest of the world. So when you're doing the database design, you don't go for perfect. You don't go for everything, including the kitchen sink and the toaster. You aim for, because the guy, the person was asking for a couch, not asking for the kitchen. Therefore, just do the minimum you need. And then if you need to do more, you do another iteration and you add a little more and you add a little more. So the design process is made up of four steps. And then there's an end of process review. So the processes are as follows. Identification. So you identify the need. You describe the need. If you can't describe it to someone else, you don't know what you're doing. And maybe you should be asking someone else to help you understand the goal. It's similar to business rules. You know how business rules should be short, succinct, and easy to understand? Describing the process and the concepts of a database should be the same. You should be able to explain the content and what this database is for without having to pull out big piles of jargon. And then you describe the pieces of the database. So now you're going to create the entities and the, op, you know, basically you code the database. I hate that phrase, but we're going to go with code the database. You create relationships. Then you look at the database structure and you go, did I do anything stupid? So at this point, you'll do a quick pass of normalization. And by normalization, uh, you're actually looking for the um, anomalies. Not specifically go through all three steps of normalization. You're looking at all your tables. You're going, is there going to be any insert, update, or delete anomalies in this table? No, I don't see any problems. Good, moving on. And then you do a review. This is when you hope you have another set of eyes who can look at your database structure and go, bruh, what are you doing? If you don't have a second set of eyes, the rule would, the, usually the rule of thumb is, is you put it away for 24 hours. Go do something else. Go work on a different project. Go take a walk. Go take a nap. Go take a special kind of nap. There's all kinds of things you can do. Go walk the dog. Uh, do a nap on the couch while watching TV, you know, whatever works for you. Just stop thinking about it. And then you go back the next day with quote unquote fresh eyes and you go through the, you look at it and going, okay, why did, why, if you can look at your design and you go, why did I choose to do this? And it's not clear. Then either you didn't document your database structure or you did something weird and you need to re-examine that piece. And I've done it where I've gone back to a database I worked on years ago going, what the heck was I thinking? Obviously, I must have been in a rush for that one because it makes no sense now. It is how it is. All right. So step one, identification. So when we're identifying all the bits and pieces that are supposed to go into the database, there's two common paths. And there's like a hybrid of the two. So path one, it's recreation or reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is a bit of a bad word in the industry um, because, you know, people don't like it when you reverse engineer their stuff. But essentially, you have an existing system. You need to replicate it, but you do not have access to the actual structure. Um, I had a really interesting experience of this as my very first job. I get hired straight out of college. and this company decided to hire a very cheap programmer because, you know, straight out of college, we're cheap. And back then we were really cheap, like 10 bucks an hour, cheap 26 years ago, um, to redo their point of sale system because the vendor of the point of sale system they were using went under. Well, they didn't go under. They just decided they were done doing that and they shut down. 
So they needed to recreate it because they couldn't add any features. They couldn't get any updates, nothing. So they needed to replace it. But their contract stated I could not look at the database structure. So I couldn't look at how the code was written. I couldn't look at how the database was structured or any of it. So I had to look at all the inputs, go through the process and figure out how it needs to be stored. Uh, let me tell you, as a fresh graduate from college, I made some really stupid decisions in that project. Um, I'm looking at, nowadays, there's a lot of things I did then I wouldn't do now. But that being said, it was a very big learning experience because I had to learn to understand the concept of data. Path two, clean room implementation. Clean room implementation is often more enjoyable because you're not trying to map out something that already exists. You're not trying to mimic something that exists. You are trying to create something new. Whether you know, your boss went on a vision quest, came back with a stupid idea and decided it needs a database. And it's going to happen because they decided it was going to happen, whether it's a good idea or not. The clean room implementation means that you're coming in blind. You have no idea what the data requirements are. You have no idea what the data is going to be. So you spend time doing research. You look into the similar type project products. Uh, you go ask all the potential end users, you know, what kind of data do you need? And you document all that, and then you start, you know, creating a design. Um, obviously, both of these have some common steps. And the common steps would be identify all the possible gross data objects. By gross, I don't mean disgusting. By gross, in this case, it means the, the bigger pieces. Right? When you go by a gross of... I don't know, bottled water. We have to end up with a skid of bottled water. So you identify the big pieces. Users, customers, orders are examples. You list the objects and you categorize them. So you go through all the objects, you create some categories, and you figure out, you know, what things are. And then you're going to describe. And specifically here, I'm talking about describing the actual components of the database. So for each of the objects, you're going to add all the basic fields, as you guys also know them as attributes. Um, you'll potentially add identifiers or primary keys, descriptor fields, blah, blah, blah. Um, if you work in certain industries, you're going to add some extra fields on there, like created date, modified date, deleted date, um, you know, who cr created by, modified by, potentially deleted by. Um, eh? Time differences. There could be a bunch of things you add in there just to keep track of all the require the legal ease, right? So then you try to identify as much as possible. Again, if I look at students and I try to identify as many pieces of data I need about a student. So I know I need a first name, a last name, potentially a middle name. I need a home address. I need a mailing address. I need a current living address. I need a phone number, potentially a second phone number, or even a third phone number, right? A home phone number, their cell phone number, and their current living address phone number. Uh, email address, potentially two email addresses. Um, where were they, re Where? how did they get it put into the system? Were they referred by via some other party? Um, what program are they interested in or enrolled in? You know, I'm just listing things off the top of my head. So as you are trying to identify as much as you can right off the bat, because you might identify more than you really need, and then it's easy to start discarding. But later on down the road, you might get yourself into a situation where you don't have everything you need, and it's going to be harder to add it. So you try to make it as well-rounded as possible. Uh, then you're going to assign some data types to each of the fields. Um, so that one's pretty straightforward also. You're going to say, oh, that's a person's name, so it's going to be a Varkar field. It's a person's uh, date of birth. Well, that's a date, you know, stuff like that. While trying to stick as close to um, generic data types as humanly possible, try to avoid system-specific data types, especially at this stage. So then you create the relationships. So you create the connections between the objects. Uh, you identify which objects are parents and which are children. Um, you try to identify what's mandatory. 
Um, and then you create the foreign keys as needed. And then you normalize. So using the rules normalization, you want to break down the design. So we know what the rules are. First normal form, table should have no repeating fields, a primary key, and it's organized in rows. Second normal form, all data in the tables that have correlated primary keys must depend, depend on the whole key. And in third normal form is all data must rely on the primary key. By the way, that's the plain English summary of last week's lecture, if you're curious. Um, to put in the technical terms, first normal form has um, no repeating groups of rows and no multi-valued attributes. Second normal form is um, we've removed um, partial dependencies. There's that's the word. And the third normal form we got rid of transitive dependencies. Um, you're going to create reference tables as needed. Um, you guys probably don't know what a reference table is. A reference table is a table in the database used to hold values. Duh. But it's for a list of values. An order status. Shipping method. State, province. Country. Um, title of address. Oh, Mr. or Mrs. Miss. Uh, potentially, you know, suffix on the name for people who have letters after their name. <laughs> that, that doesn't always include, you know, PhD, master's, whatever. It could also be junior, senior. There's a few different things that could go into that name suffix. Um, so reference tables are used. So and basically you can picture it this way. Whenever you use uh, an, an application, a database application or a web form of some sort as a drop down. Odds are that drop down is coming from a reference table. What's cool about that is if you need to rename one of these values, you don't have to change the application code. You update that one row in the database, and suddenly that value shows up for everyone right away. Um, one case a few years ago. Uh, the tech support manager at my company was a little um, special. I guess we're going to go with, with word special. And he didn't like some of the statuses that we had assigned to tickets. He thought they were not intuitive. So a ticket that had a status of waiting for engineering was too complicated. Can anybody in here guess what waiting for engineering means? Come on, it's not that hard. You're waiting for a programmer to tell you if it's broken or not. You're waiting for, you know, somebody in the engineering department to deal with the problem. It was too complicated for him. It had to be called waiting. But the problem is we had waiting for engineering, waiting for printer development, waiting for sales. So we had three waitings turned into one. It was just waiting and nobody knew what the status was anymore. The nifty thing was is that about after about two weeks, everybody complained how stupid this was. I was able to go back to the database and just change the values. And the drop downs suddenly started working the way they used to because we never deleted data. We just renamed some values and marked them as active or inactive. So those are reference tables. Um, Sometimes you'll have fields in a standard table and you're going to replace those with the reference tables. Um, a good example of that, again, is state or country. Years ago, and most of you are probably too young to remember this, uh, but those of us of a certain vintage remember the internet when it first started. And you'd go and fill in a registration form. And they didn't have drop downs for country. They didn't have a drop down for state. They gave you a plain text field Ontario, Canada. And the company I worked for was the same. I've been there for 20, almost 23 years. So 
our original forms were like that. So users could just type in whatever the heck they wanted into those fields. Um, do you know how much fun it is trying to run a report to figure out how many people are in the US? How many different ways could you put in the United States? United States, United States of America, USA, US, U.S.A. U.S.A. Right? And insert varying misspelled versions of this because people couldn't type. So instead of just picking from a report saying, oh, I want the ones in the US, well, I had to write a report and actually identify about 26 different combinations of United States. It was disgusting. So you don't want these fields where people can type stuff in, you want them to pick it. So the goal is in the end, you want to be normalized to third normal form once you've identified that. And the reference table one is another one where you don't want to go too far either because it becomes unusable. For example, you're not going to put city in a dropdown because that's just dumb. You'd have to put in every stupid little bump on the road as a place. Now, anybody here from Northern Ontario other than me? No, shoot. Okay, so in Northern Ontario, the definition of city changes. It, a lot of people don't realize that. Once you go, you hit North Bay, so North Bay South, the definition of the city is 40,000 people. North Bay, North of North Bay is 10,000, is defined as a city. Suddenly the meaning of city changes. So that which also means that meaning of a town and a village changes also. There's places up there that actually have an official name on a map with a population of 12 people. And you'd have to have that in every drop down. So you don't want to go too far with the reference tables. All right, then you do a review. You'd review the design for potential issues. Hopefully, you try to find a peer to review your design. Um, because, well, you know, a second set of eyes is always better. Having somebody who's with a fresh perspective is a good thing. Um, if you identify any weaknesses, you start over at step one, you identify what needs to be done, you describe it, you design it, you add it on, and you check it, then you do it the review, and you try to plan in such a way that you're not going to put yourself in a corner, but you also try not to over-engineer. Because over-engineering is a bad thing. Okay. So after you've created your masterpiece of a database, comes testing. Testing is important. I know you're, you're all genius coders that don't need to test your code. And you've never issued a single error in any of your code ever since you've started school. For the rest of us, we cause errors all the time and testing is required. So test data gives us a few things. It gives the developers something to work with. In other words, you're gonna generate a database and the people programming the interface will have data to play with already. Working against an empty database is very difficult because you really don't know what it's gonna look like. Uh, it also lets you do some load testing. So you create some database structures and you start inserting hundreds of thousands of rows, millions of rows. So then you can test how slow things get. And a badly designed database or a database that is not optimized, that's not the same thing, um, can get slow when you have a lot of data or you have very complex queries and that will give you things that you may need to go and address. Um, now there's many sites that offer this service. In actual fact, I'm pretty sure actually one of these no longer exists. I think that bottom one is gone from when the slide was created. However, uh, generatedata.com is absolutely fantastic for generating realistic looking data. Uh, it's under constant development. The, the guy who writes it, by the way, you notice I said the guy, it's a one man shop who's writing this tool, uh, is constantly adding features. It's gone to the point now where uh, you can use nationalized names. So let's say you decide to have people in, in Scotland, you, want, you include Scotland as one of your target pieces of data. You can get it to pick towns that belong to Scotland. You can also have Scottish sounding names in your database. 
It's really nifty. Uh, it'll generate phone numbers based on a mask. So it looks like North American phone numbers. Um, you need postal codes. It'll, you can get it to match the postal code to the country, your map. I, it's gotten to the point now where if I'm right, uh, last time I used it, it generated postal codes correct to the province. Randomly generates it. It looks real. Um, Mockaroo is cool. It has different data from generate data. Uh, different options, I mean. Like, it, you know, different products offer different things. Free data generator was really nifty, and I think that's the one that's gone. Uh, it actually supported parent-child structures. So you could define three or four table structures at once and say, this field in this table comes from the primary key of this table. So as it would generate rows for the first table, it would then randomly generate rows for the second table so that things lined up. And I'm actually going to show you guys generate data really quick, just so that you know what I'm talking about. Oh, that's kind of cool. It remembers the last thing I did. Okay, I'm going to close that. So we, here you can see, and that's really small. Holy cow. Uh, all right, that's still kind of small, but we're going to roll with it. So you can see here, you get the data type. You give it a column name. It gives you some examples and some options. And... The different data types it pulls up is you can it's quite significant. You got companies, address. Uh, you can even get it to do long, uh, longitude, latitudes, so you can actually do fake GOIP stuff. Uh, fixed number of words. So if you need to have a block of text like lorem ipsum, you can say generate lorem ipsum, and it always has to be so many words long. Or you could tell it to be a random number of words, so somewhere between ten to thirty words. Uh, you can do alphanumeric, uh, booleans, auto-incrementing, uh, number range. Number range is a nifty one because you can use it for foreign keys. So let's say you know there's 100 rows in your parent table. You can do the number range to be between 1 and 100. So every time you generate a row, it'll randomly tie it to a parent record. Um, constants, computed, uh, fake URLs. Uh, currency, uh, bank IBAN numbers, fake credit card numbers. And you can pick the kind of credit card it's going to be, which is kind of nifty. Uh, CVVs, you know that three digits on the back of your credit card or the four digits on the front of the MasterCard? Uh, MasterCard uh, Amex. Uh, a PIN, you want fake PINs? They'll do that too. So you can actually generate realistic looking banking data. Uh, track one, track two is something that most of you probably don't know about. Um, you know the mag strip on the back of your credit card? There's multiple tracks of information embedded in that. Um, and there's uh, usually a lot of information in there, like your driver's license. Used to be if you swipe that, it would come up with uh, pretty much all the information on the front of the card. So your driver's license number, your name, your address, date of birth, expiry. Conditions, you know, glasses, that kind of stuff. Um, and apparently it's a country-specific one, which is a Chilean rut number, whatever that is. So when you generate it, it'll generate all kinds of stuff. You can tell it to do um, sp system-specific inserts. So MySQL, Postgres, SQLite. Um, you can tell it to do include drop tables, create table if you want to. You give it the name of the table, so it generates a proper insert statement. Uh, you can do an insert. You can do updates, which is kind of cool. It'll just generate the data for you. Um, and as you change database structures, you will see how it, for example, Oracle doesn't support multi-inserts. Therefore, it'll actually tune it to the target. And Microsoft SQL Server likes square brackets. So it'll put those in for you. It's kind of cool. Um, and you've got all these other formats, which is nice. Uh, you can make it output a table or, you know, some JSON for your JSON practicing stuff. Um, you want to have a Python array? Congrats. It'll build you a nice fake array with 100 elements in it.
And you can use this to generate this kind of stuff even for outside the database. So generate data is a very handy tool. And once it's generated, uh, let me go back to SQL like that, then close that one. You can, when you generate it, and you can download, I have no idea why my laptop's so slow today. And there it is. So you got a nice set of inserts. So that's just a cool tool. That's not going to be on a test. I just thought it would be handy for you guys to actually see how you use a data generator. Um, when I first started working in the industry, we didn't have stuff like this. We actually had to write our own generators. And that really sucked. Um, at one point, we decided to stop using our own generator and we paid a company to generate fake data for us because they actually did it as a service. Uh, it cost us uh, $2,200 for them to generate 1,000 rows of data per table. Yeah, it was a really good business model. They made a killer and killing back then. And then generatedata.com showed up to the party. Not, you know, they've been, he's been doing this for about 10 years. And I'm like, I see that I'm going, man, what the heck were we paying for? Uh, some people release products that, that pay for products where you give money and you can install it and it does the exact same thing. But, you know, the best part of generate data, you can download the source code and install it on your own machine and then tweak it. All right. So done talk about test data. I'm now going to talk about data types. So by now you guys should have an okay idea of the different data types in a database. Um, from last term, because you've run queries, so you've experienced, you know, text and that kind of stuff. So, specifically, there are uh, three common text types. There is a car or character. Depending on the database system, it'll be car, character, and if you want to talk about Microsoft SQL Server specific, they'll also have something called NCAR. Uh, N stands for nationalized. Uh, and so instead of counting the bytes, it counts the characters instead. So a car field is a fixed length field. So if you define something as a car six, it will always occupy the space of six characters, whether it's, you know, an end car or a regular car. Um, by six characters, it means it occupies six bytes, unless, of course, you're doing uh, Chinese, Japanese, you know, um, whatever languages that use extra bytes because they have so many characters in their alphabet. Alphabet's not the right word, but we're going to go with that. Um, it will always occupy, so if you do a car six, it'll always be six long. You put in letter A, it still occupies six bytes. It was important way back in the day. Um, anybody here watch a movie where the computers were running on tape? You know, you got the big, yeah, the big wheels going back and forth, moving a piece of tape back and forth through a, a magnetic reader. What was important about that is because it was always six bytes long, it knew exactly how many millimeters to move the tape for every field. So it didn't need to constantly read it. It would go, oh, I'm at car, it's a car six, I need the next field. So it would go skip the distance and start reading the next field, skip the distance, read the next field because it always knew how much space to move. Once magnetic media, in the sense of hard drives, showed up to the party, car fields weren't that useful anymore. Uh, so they came up with varcar, which is very varying character length. So you define something as varcar 10. It will occupy the number of bytes for each character plus a termination byte. So there is a, a, a special set of bits at the end that tells it this is the end of the data. So if you do a VARC R10, you put in the letter A, it will occupy one byte plus a little bit. That way it's not using up any more room on the disk. Because with the car, even though you only have the letter A in it, the rest of it will be padded with spaces. Either at the beginning or at the end, whichever way the database engine insists on doing it. 
That means it's still going to occupy 6 or 10 bytes, 250 bytes, whatever it is you defined it as length. With the varchar, it's always the length of the string plus 1. Text, which is used to store large chunks of text. Uh, MySQL has three different kinds of text fields. Uh, because MySQL is special that way. Every other database server has text. Microsoft SQL Server and Sybase, they have something called memo. Memo, text, they're the same thing. But MySQL has a small text, uh, sorry, tiny text, medium text, and long text. If you just do a text, then it ends up being a small text. Good job, MySQL. Um, I have no idea why they did it that way. It's just somebody thought they were being smart by making things harder than it needs to be. Um, in most database servers, the text field is basically limited by the amount of disk space you have. A, in Postgres, for example, a text field can occupy up to one terabyte of text. You'd never ever do that because that's just dumb. But in theory, you could. You could take the entire Encyclopedia Britannica and put it all in that one text field. It'd be totally useless, but it could be done. And for those of you too young to know what that is, it's what we had before Wikipedia. We have number types. Integers. You guys should know what integers are. It's level 2 college. They're whole numbers. And you have integer, int. Those two are synonymous with each other. With each other. There's small int and big int. So small int and big int exist in pretty much all database servers. Um, Medium int and integer are the same thing. Tiny int is a very small integer. <laughs> it'll go up to, uh, if it's unsigned, it'll go up to 256. If it is signed, it goes from minus 128 to 127. That's my SQL things. Um, you have decimals and numerics. Decimal and numerics are often used for money. And when I tell people, when you're designing a database, you try to stick to generic data types that will work the same on all servers. And decimal and numeric are, are aliases of each other. They, they All database servers will let you use both keywords, and they both do the same thing. So they basically did it for compatibility reasons. And there's another type called money, which is similar, except that money is only ever two decimal places. Now, I put my marker away. Decimal is an interesting data type because it's defined by a length and precision. So if I go numeric, 10, 3. What this is saying is it'll let me store 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Ten. 10 digits with three of the 10 reserved for decimal places. So this is the 10, this is the three. So the reason why this or decimal, whichever one, uh, is superior to using the money data type is a lot of financial services worry about more than two decimal places. Although we only look at money and go, it's uh, 1097. Great. Or we buy gas, and right now gas is, uh, what is it, a buck 49? Once was a time where we the prices were, you know, 49.9 cents, which would have been, you know, this place moving. So one of the things we worry about precision here is like exchange rates. When you do money exchange rates, the more precision you have in your decimal places, the more accurate your exchange rates going to be for that day, the less likely you're going to have some weird rounding issues later. Um, since decimal only ever does, I mean decimal money, only does two places of precision, you're going to lose precision. Um, and by the way, the numeric, decimal, and money data types all do rounding for you. You don't need to do the rounding. So if you want to insert something with five or six decimal places, it'll round it up for you automatically. 
And I guarantee the computer is a lot better at rounding than you are. If from what I've seen students that have tried to do some manual rounding in class in the past, people don't know how to round anymore. I don't know if they just don't teach in high school, but people have forgotten how to round. Um, you got float and double. So I actually used to know the specific number of decimal places these were accurate to. Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Um, but these are for numbers that have a lot of decimal places. You need a lot of precision. Um, they're usually used in scientific or engineering purposes. Never use float or double for money. Because then you're going to have to round everything in the end to show it. Um, you have bit, which is literally zero or one. But it's not really a Boolean. Don't ask. I have no idea. Um, you have other, you have date time. You have date, date time, time and year. Um, and then there's timestamp. And timestamp's a little special. Um, in MySQL, the timestamp always defaults to the current time automatically. You can only ever have one time timestamp field per table. Otherwise, you have to use date time. And timestamp in MySQL only supports dates after January 1st, 1970. It's epoch. It's epoch. It's this, this is the start of Unix timestamps. Essentially, it, the way timestamps are stored in MySQL is it counts the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. It just uses integers for time. They're gross. It's hard to work with. Yes. Twenty thirty-eight. Yep. Well, only in really, really old computers. Uh, any version of uh, Linux, Unix, um, and other derivatives of that nature since the 64-bit processor era came out, will not have that problem. The old COBOL computers, on the other hand, that, you know, the banks are trying to hurry up and replace, may have some issues. Is it going to be the end of the world? Uh, no more than the year 2000 was. As a person that was sitting in the office at two minutes before midnight, New Year's Eve, because of Y2K, and Y2K came and went with just a And I got to go home at 5 after 12 because nothing in the building melted. But, you know, yes, that literally 2038 was it. There is a hard limit on the Unix timestamp with the old format of it. Uh, the new one is 64-bit data type, so we're good to like, like the year 64,000 or something. So we're not too worried about it. Um, there's time and year. Um, those are what's known as the generic data types. And there is one other one in here that's not mentioned, which is Boolean. Every database server that I've ever worked with, except for MySQL, supports Booleans. You guys know what a Boolean is, right? True, false. Database servers are special about Booleans. Why? Because it can be true, false, or I don't know. Booleans in databases are trinary not binary, because it can be null. Therefore, if it's null, it means I don't know. MySQL doesn't have Booleans. What does it do? It uses a tiny int one, a single digit integer, which means it supports no and nine flavors of yes. Zero, one to nine, and null. So. Is that an advantage? I really don't know. Um, I'm not a fan of the whole concept of multiple shades of yes. Anybody with a significant others, other knows multiple shades of yes, and it's never fun being on the receiving end of it. And I kept that one gender neutral, you might have noticed. Yeah, true enough. But, you know, it's... It allows you literally have one to nine versions of yes, which is not great. And like I said, the bit type does not work. 
So when you're choosing your data types, you have to take things into consideration. How big is the data? What is the longest I think the data is ever going to be? Is it numeric? Does it have decimal places? Is it a date? If it's a date, you'll notice in here I have a, an actual statement. If it's a date, should you include the time? The answer is yes, always. Except for things that never will ever, ever, ever need a time, always include the time. So use a date time or, or whatever applicable. So an example of a field that never needs the date, the time, other than in a hospital, date of birth. How many of you know the very moment you were born, the time you were born? Congratulations, there were a couple of people in here. I have no idea. I know it's some, apparently sometime around 4 a.m. in my case. But in real-world application outside of a hospital, date of birth does not need a time. Who cares? Like, I know you know. I'm not making fun of you. I just, who cares? The only person that cares is your mother. <laughs> right? But for everything else, you should always include the time. Why? Let's go with orders. So we have an order. And whenever you look at your order, so, you know, you buy something from Canadian Tire. And actually, Canadian Tire has gotten really good because they actually include the time now as part of the order date. Like, they show it on the receipt. But a lot of times when you place an order and you get an invoice, you'll just have a date, you know, order date, invoice date. And picture this. So you design this database. The orders only have dates. There's no time. And after operating for a year or two, a manager says, I want to run some, run some metrics. What time of day do we have the most sales? Or what time of day? Are there the most manual sale entries where, you know, somebody takes a sale over the phone and you don't have times in your database? You're like, I don't know. We don't have that data. Whereas if you're just taking the time to add a time, like do the date time, you could have been storing this for years and come out looking like a hero because you already have the data. Now the best you could do is modify the database, modify the application. So it starts keeping track of that but you'll still have a whole block of time where you don't have that information. So if it's a date, always include the time unless it's a very specific use case, such as a date of birth. Honestly, outside of date of birth, I can't even think of another spot where you need the, not to have the time. Maybe graduate date of enrollment. But even then, the system's going to want to know when they received the data from whatever system when you enrolled into a school. Just include it. Even if you can you can truncate the date and not show it. Yeah. Date of birth is that. The birth, date of birth, birthdays is the only thing that you ever have to worry about not needing the time. That's one of the few. I'm sure there's others. But, you know, in practicality, I've never seen a single instance where we needed anything but the whole thing. You can always format the date and trunk off the time so you're not showing it, but collect it. It takes up, you know, maybe an extra two bytes for every row of data. It's nothing. Uh, if you're going to store large blocks of text, how big is the text? So will a Varkar 255 do the job or should just use a text field? Um, text fields are hard to index. They take up a lot of room. Varkars are easy to index because they're fixed length. Or maximum length, I should say. The last one says, just say no to blobs. Now, blobs. Blob stands for binary large object. And it's a special data type. Most database servers have it. Uh, Oracle calls it something else. I don't remember what it is. I think it's called byte A in Oracle. Um, and also known as a byte array. So a blob allows you to store raw binary data in the database table. All right, so how big are the pictures that come off your cell phone? I have an S22. My pictures are what, 3.7 megs on average. Unless I'm shooting raw, then it's, you know, 20 megabytes a picture. And we're gonna, somebody says, I'm gonna create a database and I'm gonna put all my pictures in the database so I can query, get the data out using a query. Cool. So
So we know that's not right. Okay, so that's how many bytes in a megabyte, right? There's a lot of bytes. So we're going to go with the size of my phone's pictures. So each picture I take occupies that many megabytes. Cool. Now I'm going to ask, how many pictures on average are on your phone? Yours is like, mine's probably sitting at like a thousand. Yeah, okay, so let's go with uh, 4,500 pictures because, you know, so now this is how many bytes we're storing. So now we're going to bring this back down to a size our brains are able to understand. So 16 gigs. That's just not that big. That's still pretty chunky. 16 gigs. Now we're going to back that up. We're going to run a backup. And you guys are going to learn about backups after the break. So we have a 16 gig backup. While that file is, while that one table, because this is going to be in one table, is being backed up, the table is locked. That means it can't be written to, it can't be updated, it can't be, nothing can be deleted, and it's locked for the entire time of the backup. 16 gigs being backed up usually takes, I can say most database servers don't have insanely fast hard drives because they don't need super fast hard drives. They're on an array. It's still going to take a while. So say five minutes. So you've got five minutes of downtime while you back up that 16 gigs. And that's in one table, not even including the rest of the database. Um, then you take that and you, it keeps getting fatter and fatter every day. So you add another 100 pictures every day. So at the end of the year, you could be looking at, you know, potentially 200 gigs being backed up every day. Where are you going to put that 200 gigs every day? It's pointless. Um, Database server crashes, you know, because you're running it on your Raspberry Pi because you're clever. And there's a power outage. Your Raspberry Pi turns off because it's not on a UPS. You launch it. MySQL launches the database and the database is now corrupt because it was in the middle of backing up or writing to that table and it failed and died. So now you're, you've lost 16 gigs of data because you got to try to recover from backup which you may or may not have. So how do you handle blobs outside of, you know, the situation? What you would normally do is you'd have a, a varchar field with a file name. You put the file on the disk in a directory structure and you store the file name. Maybe you'll store the path, the whole path, plus the file name, because 255 characters is pretty much a limit for most file systems. Therefore, the database is nice and tiny. Files are on disk. You can run a differential backup of the disk. So that means only new files get backed up every day. So your backups are small. The backups are fast. Cool. So just say no to blobs. Uh, blobs have one purpose, and it's to store data when you can't store it in the database any other way. A sim an example of this is you need to store the raw bytes of a piece of text. So Let's say you have a form on your website that only accepts Latin one character set. So pretty much anything from the Western alphabet, whether it's the Italian or Portuguese, French, whatever, German, it only handle those characters. And somebody comes in and they think they're smart and they fill in the form using moon runes. Whether it's Chinese, Japanese, whatever, those characters will not go into a normal text field. So you'd store that into a blob because you're going to store the raw bytes of whatever they typed in. Uh, another purpose um, at my day job is we write printer drivers and we need to put in the control strings in the database because we generate the drivers from entries in the database. And control strings are escape characters. You can't store escape characters into a text field because it'll actually try to escape them. And if you wonder what an escape character is, um, Control Z, for example, the sound, the bell. Did you know there's an actual keystroke combination you can do to make your computer go ding? But some printers actually use those special characters to tell it that something's coming down the pipe that it needs to pay attention to. 
we need to store that in the database, so we use a blob. So blobs are only used when you need to store stuff in the database that doesn't fit into a text field safely. All right, now we're gonna talk about keys. Synthetic versus natural, and we're almost done for today. Today's a pretty reasonable lecture. All right, so we know what a composite key is. It's a key composed of two or more attributes. Um, a natural key, it's a key that's made up of attributes that already exist in the real world. Examples of this would be a social security number in the US, a SIN number in Canada, um, an NIN number in the UK, driver's license numbers. You know, any of those things could, could be considered natural keys because they're unique. Synthetic keys, also known as a surrogate key, it's a key that has no business meaning. In other words, it's an automatically generated number, one, two, three, four, five. It has no real world meaning. And it's all have a synthetic key associated to you right now. Your student number. Um, although it starts with zero, four, zero, everything after that is a sequence. Um, I don't remember what the zero, four, zero stands for. There's actually a meaning behind it. And I actually had a prof that would, that's been here since like the eighties. Tell me what that stood for. And I don't remember what the O four was for, but it has a meaning. Okay. So it was literally zero, four and then the rest. So that's a lot of students. Um, primary key. Well, you guys know what a primary key is. It's a unique identifier in a table. A foreign key is uh, one or more attributes in a table, like a column in a table that references the primary key elsewhere. All right. So it's a wall of text talking about issues with natural keys. So issue number one, the primary key size. Surrogate keys don't have a problem with index sizes because they're single column of an integer. Computers are really, really good at storing numbers. I mean, did you know you can count to 32 on one hand? You need five bits to count to 32, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What's seven on three, three bits? So, Integers don't take up a lot of room. On the other hand, a sin number is not an integer. It's a string. Even though it looks like a number, it smells like a number, it's a string. It will always occupy nine characters, which is nine bytes. I know, we're talking about computers with terabytes of disk space. What's nine bytes? Well, we have to index those nine bytes. Indexes take up room. You have a database with a you know 14 million entries, nine bytes times 14 million, it starts getting a little chunky. Foreign key size. Well, if the primary key is fat, the foreign key is gonna be fat too. That's self-explanatory. Aesthetics. Now, that one's an eye of the beholder thing, because old time database developers really loved synthetic key, I mean natural keys, because it was understandable from a human perspective. So you'd see a SIN number and you know you could look up a person by their SIN number. It felt nice because, you know, it was, you were saving space. Um, synthetic keys, on the other hand, you don't have as much code because you won't have compound keys. Sometimes you end up with compound keys when you use natural keys. Uh, optionality and applicability. So. Surrogate keys do not care if someone doesn't want to give you their information or are unable to give you the information. For example, I go to a store and they say, can you give me your SIN number? I go, hell no. You're not getting my, unless I'm applying for credit, you're not getting my my SIN number. By the same token, how many of you here have a Canadian SIN number? In other words, how many of you are Canadian citizens with a SIN number? Versus how many of you do not have a Canadian SIN number? Maybe I'll actually have to look at this group. There's probably more hands that are going to go up on that one, right? Therefore, you can't give somebody a SIN number because you don't have one. So that's where the optionality and applicability come in, where you could use a synthetic key and not actually be able to have the data given to you. Therefore, you cannot collect that piece of information. Again, synthetic keys don't care. 
Uniqueness. Synthetic keys are guaranteed to be 100% unique. On the other hand, natural keys are not guaranteed to be unique. There are cases where you could get identifier collisions, SIN number versus passport number. That actually did happen here at the school years and years and years ago before we had uh, student numbers. They had an international student that came in, they gave their passport number, passport number matched somebody's SIN number. They couldn't put the person's passport number into the system. Congratulations, can't find the student. Um, privacy. Synthetic keys don't care because they have no meaning. On the other hand, if you have a person's SIN number as your primary key and then you've got the receptionist punching in people's press SIN numbers just to find their customer records, that's not great. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as it is, don't store people's SIN numbers uh, unless you absolutely have to. Don't include credit card numbers and drive anything that uniquely identifies a person. Try not to store that unless you have to or you have really good security. Um, accidental denormalization. You can't accidentally denormalize non-business data. Um, that's self-explanatory. Cascading updates. Surrogate keys don't change, so you don't need to worry about how to cascade them on update. So you do an update. For example, somebody's SIN number gets compromised. Identity is stolen. Person gets a new SIN number. You'd have to go through the system and start updating everywhere the SIN number is, and suddenly you update the person's record and all the child records that are depending on that too. Suddenly you got this weird cascading update across keys. It's a real pain. Um, join speeds. Joining across VAR cards is slow as molasses. Joining across integers is fast. You guys learned about joins last term. You probably didn't learn about how the fact that if you join using VAR cars, it's slower than if it's integers. Again, a SIN number is nine characters long. A nine-digit phone, a nine-digit number, is you know four bytes long, five bytes, uh, four or five bits. Um, so technically, synthetic keys have disadvantages, or at least if you listen to database designers from the 80s, because they really hated synthetic keys. Um, the, one of their issues is getting the next value. So considering most servers support auto-incrementing keys of some sort, that's just a moot point. They just like to complain. Extra indexes. That one's actually the only valid argument against synthetic keys. So let's just say you have a table that uses natural keys. So you're going to index the primary key, which just could be, you know, the SIN number. You index maybe their name and you index maybe their phone number. So those searches are faster. And let's just say you decide you're going to use a synthetic key instead. Well, you're always going to have number of indexes plus one because the synthetic key is going to have its own index plus all the ones you would have indexed anyways. Whoopee. They don't take up that much room. Indexes on integers don't take up a lot of room. It's not going to affect performance. It's not going to affect size of backups. So it's the only argument I've ever heard that's valid against synthetic keys is that. Okay. So that gets us to the end of today. And we're actually right on schedule, almost 6.30. I like being done at 6.30. So, um, oh, I am going to put up an example because I've had a few questions about Lab 4. Uh, specifically, um, somebody was asking about... Oh, you know, the, the, the repeating, the repeating thing. And hang on. So for those of you that are confused about, because it only gives you this, the, the, the PT train, the PT session, the personal trainer session, which, uh, let me just go pull that up here. Come on. Well, 
too far. This right here. So you see where it says PT session, you got the trainer, phone, blah, blah, blah. And the person was asking, um, identify possible multi-value dependencies. And they're like, okay, well, I don't have any data to actually know what it is you're talking about. So I'll post this as part of the uh, announcements. But if you picture, this is what that means. Where you have a specific trainer and then you have a bunch of clients tied to that trainer. That is the multi-value dependency. And by the way, how would you resolve that? Just like that. You'd start that to get it the first normal form. So that's the potential multi-valued. Um, so I'll actually, I'll probably add this to the lab so you guys have it. If I remember, if I don't remember, somebody call me out. I'm okay being called that when I forget to do stuff. And I'll also include it with the announcement so you guys have my, you know, my fake Excel spreadsheet for you guys to play with. Okay. Outside of that, you're looking at lab. Oh, you got a question. Three? Okay. You can have... Hang on, does it say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if it's a conceptual diagram, yes, you can have many to many. The physical diagram is a you cannot have many to many. MySQL Workbench won't even let you do it. Just so you can see. Hang on, I'll show you what happens when you try to do it in MySQL Workbench. Just so that you don't have any surprises, okay? Right, that's for, um, and that just jumped. So this one here is more about conceptual diagramming. So if I create, I'm going to create a uh, an empty diagram, just do the many to many. So yeah, I, with, for this lab, I'm happy getting a conceptual diagram. I'm more worried about you showing the concepts. So it's an ERD, not a physical diagram. Yeah. All right, table one, table two, and I'm going to put in ID, primary key, ID, primary key. Okay, so I got my two, oops, no, I didn't take it. This, okay. So I got the two primary keys. I'm going to try using the many-to-many -many relationship tool. It actually creates the uh, the associative entity for you. So it's because it is physically impossible to do many to many in a database. Many to many can exist at the conceptual stage. When you do the physical, it cannot be there. Does that answer your question? Well, it the one that one just asks you about submitting an ERD. So I'm more worried about the a. Okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you, you know, it says here, any ER modding software can be used to create the diagrams, including MySQL Workbench. Now, if you use MySQL Workbench to do this lab, you won't be able to do the many-to-many. -many. If you use ERD+, then you can use the many-to-many. -many. It depends the style of diagram you give me, because MySQL Workbench cannot do conceptual diagrams. It only does physical diagrams. And what can you not do in a physical diagram? Many-to-many. So if you choose to use MySQL Workbench, yes, you're going to have this. Exactly. Yeah, so you can do it this way if you want. I won't take points away if you resolve your many-to-many -many dependencies. I'm not going to take points away if you don't resolve them if you're using, like, ERD+. I'm more worried about whether or not you understand the concept of diagramming. Like, can you put in the entities and their attributes and connect connect them with using relationships? Yes. Congrats. You're going to get your points. It's this this particular topic is more about the concept of diagramming than me being nitpicky about the fact that you misspelled the word minimum. Because you know, there's some profs that'll take points away for the dumbest things. Oh, you didn't include 26 comments in your five lines of Python. Minus two. That's, you know, I don't know if it's been like that for you guys, but I've had students complain to me about their Java profs. 
in the computer programmer and the engineering technology course where they literally have to have a comment above every single line of code. Otherwise, they lose points. And I'm like, you know what? When you look at my code, there are no comments. <laughs> Why? Because I write code that's understandable if you've been programming for more than like two weeks. The only time you need comments in your code in the real world is if you're doing something weird or you are processing things that switch based on incoming data and people might not know what those conditions are. So, you know, in the if statement, you're going to go, okay, we didn't get a successful credit card transaction. Else, they were successful. But other than that, you don't put in lots of comments. So I'm not going to ding anybody on that. <laughs>